Hello everyone, this is Dr. Clinton and I have a couple minutes here free to talk to you guys about um, my experience with a little device I want to share to you. So I've already made a previous video and this video is like two to three weeks into using this device. So this device is basically, as you can see, here's my name and phone number. I don't want to lose it. So this device is the, you'll see it right here. It's this thing right here. It's the VScan Air SL and it's an incredible device. I have no words, like I love it. It's incredible. It's a work of art, masterpiece, however you want to call it. Yeah, it's incredible. And I've got, look here, I have a stethoscope. Here I have another stethoscope. So usually I have always been using this stethoscope. And this stethoscope is one of the best ones you can find out there in the market. This one is the Echo Core. Um, is it? No, I had the Echo Core Duo in the past, which was fully digitalized stethoscope. Uh, but actually that one didn't work. Uh, ended up getting in contact with water and got, went to waste. So then I went with this one, which is more versatile. You can use the analogous stethoscope, meaning you can just put it on your ears and it works even if it's charged or not. And you can also turn this thing on if you want to amplify sound a whole lot of times, which is also pretty useful. So the question is, why is this little guy here in the picture, right? So here you can see one of those stethoscopes that are in the movies, which whenever there's a movie scene and there's no not a good budget for the movie or whenever they didn't have the implementation for the movie, you can buy this wherever. And this is a stethoscope that is basically just for um, auscultating uh, for the blood pressure, to get the blood pressure, right? It does work. So it does work for basic things. Actually, to be honest, I'm quite surprised of how this simple little thing it works. It outperforms what I thought it would do. I thought it was crap. I thought it didn't work at all. But I've started to use it a little bit and I've seen that it works a little. Why did I start using this one? I basically started using this one because sometimes you have this thing around your neck and this one is like three times as heavy. And you have all these things in your white coat and you end up after you see all the patients. I always have to want to have a stethoscope around me. So I'm like after I see all the patients, I have this one on and whenever anything happens, if you have to intubate a patient or something, you have this one. If you have to auscultate, yeah, this will do it. The thing, you won't be able to distinguish between a grade, you won't listen to a grade one systolic murmur probably, but it will help you with the basics, right? So now I'm using it a little bit more. And the reason I'm using it a little bit more is because I have this device with me, which actually has been so good that, and of course I know how to use it because I previously trained in cardiology in Costa Rica. So I know how to use this thing, at least for the heart. And as I'm just going on the learning curve for all the organism, all the body. So I'm getting more confident as I go with every organ system. So uh, I'm basically just, taking this with me every single time I go out of the room as you can see I have these these pants with a side pocket right here look at this it's there it goes and I just go see a patient and here I have the gel with me and that's it so that's something I'm doing for every single patient and um, it's worked it's working and I'll give you one very clear example in a, in a second so nowadays after using this device for two weeks I can't go out of the room to see a patient without this but I can leave this thing in my in the room in the wherever and this is something that I graduated medicine let's see I studied and had clinical rotation since 2009 2010 since 2010 I would never leave a room to see a patient without a stethoscope I thought it was a dishonest I thought I thought that not having a stethoscope around your neck is just disrespectful to the profession and in general terms I do think it is somewhat disrespectful unless you have something that outperforms the stethoscope, which is this thing right here. So that's why if I don't have the stethoscope, I have this thing right here and I just connect it. And yeah, can I listen to the heart sounds? I can actually see the heart beating. I can see the valves moving. I can see the Doppler flow. So I can do that. Can I listen to the lung sounds? Well, I can see the lung moving. I can see the lungs lighting. I can see if there's congestion or not. And the other question is, can you listen to the abdominal sounds? Well, I can see the abdomen moving. I can see the stomach moving. I can see if there's gastroparesis or not, suspicion, right? You know that's not the way you diagnose this thing, but you can see all those things with this. And if you want to listen to it, you can put on the Doppler and you can always dis listen if you want. So hey, I'm extremely fond of this device. Um, I, I have no words. I already explained to you. And I'll just give you one single example. So I was called to see a patient and this was an emergency patient. And I won't mention when it was. Um, and yeah, there's no identifying information here. So don't worry about that. But I was called to see a patient that was uh, unstable. So of course I put this in my pocket right over here, pocket here, take the gel, put on the stethoscope right here and out the door. So we went to see that patient. And the patient had acute desaturation as all the patients or most of the patients you are called uh, for to evaluate when there's someone unstable. So when I arrived, this patient had a, a procedure in which there was a drainage of fluid um, so this patient had a procedure where there was drainage of fluid from the pericardial sac, which the patient was had a pericardial effusion. And 
Uh, this had happened earlier that day. And uh, I, I see this patient, and we're, everyone's asking themselves, like, what are we going to do? So I am with my intern there, and I ask my intern, lead the way. What do you want? Tell me what do you think. So the intern does what uh, she should do, which is evaluate mentation. And the patient is sort of out of it a little bit, like a Glasgow comma scale of 9, 10. Uh, so the patient's mentation isn't good. So uh, then I ask the intern, what's your next step? If this was a test, what is your next best step? So the student says, hmm, bedside ultrasound. And I'm like, sounds great. So I take this thing out and we do the bedside ultrasound. So this patient had a desaturation in the morning. This patient was saturated in the 90s. And now this patient was barely in the high 80s. So this patient had gone from low flow nasal cannula in the 90s to saturated in the 80s with high flow nasal cannula plus non rebreather. And yeah, something wasn't right. Something was going on. And um, now we did the bedside ultrasound and it changed all our differential. It changed all our management. So we passed from thinking that this was a cardiac related issue or a lung related issue to actually think, no, this, is some, this might be something else. So um, the heart looked great, like ejection fraction qualitatively looked great. Pericardial fusion was there, but it was very small, nothing quite special. There was no D shape at all, meaning no special pulmonary hypertension uh, affecting the picture, no severe uh, or massive high risk pulmonary embolism going on. There was right ventricle was contracting well. There was no McConnell sign, which is seen in part, some of the high risk pulmonary embolism patients. The right ventricle was normally filled, it wasn't dilated, and it wasn't also collapsed. So volume status maybe wasn't that catastrophic in either way. And uh, contractility was good. So then we went to see the lungs. Lungs, there was lung sliding bilaterally, and these in four quadrants. And we also checked the this point, the plaps, I believe is the, the name of the point, to see if there is, um, not sure if that's the name of the point, but you get it. We checked right over here, right over here, which is the where you see the Morrison space, and the uh, splint, what's the? The other flexure, the left colic flexure as well, where the spleen is. Um, and right above that, you can see if there is a pleural effusion or not. So there was none of that. Only interestingly, on the left, I could see some sort of like consolidation or something going on there, which I wasn't quite sure what it was. So, but it didn't explain this acute change. So we decided this isn't the heart, this isn't the lung, this is something else. And we basically uh, treated the we thought it was neurological, so we were, were able to wake up the patient more, and we were able to change some of the medications, and the patient wake, woke up more, saturation increased within 10 minutes, and that's about it, and this is a case where Hocus was able to uh, change management. And all this was thought, said, and done before actually getting the stat x-ray we ordered, because they were pretty busy getting other portable x-rays, other emergent cases as well. So once the x-ray techs got there, we had already decided all this management and we were already doing things. We had already spoken to the attendant, the attendant had, was already there, we had made the decisions, and the x-ray just confirmed what we were thinking. So we didn't have to wait 30 minutes uh, without knowing, could this be horrible pericardial effusion that is going on? Could this be a myocardial infarction? Could this be a horrible pulmonary embolism? Could this be massive pneumothorax? Could this be huge effusion? None of that was suspected because it was basically ruled out on a good POCUS bedside evaluation. So that's one example of how this little device can be literally life-changing. So it has incredible image quality. I love it, love to use it. And yeah, it's a great device and it's a game changer. This thing, if you do not have a stethoscope on your neck and you have one of these, I have no problem with you. If you do not have a stethoscope on your neck and you do not have an answer like this, no, I don't like it, I think you're not doing what you should do, unless you're an orthopedist or an ophthalmologist or a dermatologist or someone who doesn't have to listen to the heart sounds quite that often. So that's it for this video and hope you liked it and I'll keep on sharing. I'll probably share some images in the future, but this is like three weeks in and by now I already have like 110 uh, imaging studies on this little device, 117. So 117, love it.